Stewart. I'm the community evangelist here at Active Rain, and I, I literally could not be more excited for my for my guest today. The, the gentleman, you see his name here on the screen. I'm going to bring him on in one second. Uh, he's an inspiration to a lot of us, myself included, and um, his story, especially as it's unfolded over the last 18 months, is, is really um, an amazing testament to just who he is and what he's built. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Dave Winninger's My Next Step, which is the book that he recently wrote. And there's some things in this book that really apply to, to our lives, to our businesses. And so, uh, Dave, how are you doing today? Hey, Bob, it's great talking to you. It's a beautiful day here in Denver. Man, um, you know what? It's the same here. I'm down in San Jose, California. It's beautiful here. I've been told that Dave is, is never short on things to say, and um, you can expect that after 40 years in the real estate business. Dave, I want to congratulate you first off. Uh, this is 2013. is the 40th year of REMAX. Um, wow. Congrats. Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's been an amazing ride. I've uh, seen a lot of changes in that 40 years. Plus, uh, I was in the business several years uh, before I started Remax, so I've kind of been around for a while. So, so they did not have the internet when you guys started. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> Al Gore had not invented it. Yet. <laughs> fact, uh, we didn't have overnight mail. We didn't have uh, uh, fax machines. Uh, if you wanted to make a copy, you stuck a piece of paper between two pieces of plastic. It came out smelling like uh, ammonia. Uh, the technology marvel of the time was an IBM Selectric uh, 2 typewriter with a self-correcting ribbon. Wow, wow. So you've come a long ways. Uh, we'll, we'll get to a couple questions about because I'm, I'm really interested in your take on the, what technology is in the business right now. But we'll, we'll deal with a couple of those a little bit later. The, the first thing that I'd like to start with, so you, you've written this book. and. For for everybody that's not familiar, I mean, in a lot of ways, on January 28th, 2012, when you wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning, or I, mean, I guess prior to waking up at, at 2 a.m. in the morning, in a, in a lot of ways, you're on top of the world. I mean, you, you've got this incredibly successful real estate business. Um, you know, after going through the book, I can tell you've got a wife that you absolutely adore. You've got kids who've, who've made successes of themselves as adults. Um, so for, for most people looking at your life at that point, you're, you're, we're thinking that here's a guy that's literally on top of the world. And, and then you wake up at 2 a.m. on January 28th, 2012, which is about 18 months ago. And f from that point, as you wake up, give me a sense of, of at, this, at this time, what, what's going on? What happens on this day? Well, you know, uh, I was on top of the world. Uh, I've had the life that I wanted, uh, have uh, all the material things, uh, homes, cars, airplanes, boats, uh, all of the uh, boy toys, uh, an adventurous life, fantastic uh, relationships. Uh, I had also back pain. Uh, okay. I had injured my back over the years. Uh, and uh, two years before, it was close to surgery, but I had a fabulous surgeon who said, Let's try some shots. We'll see if we can get rid of the inflammation by a year or two before the operation, which that was pretty cool. You know, anytime you could put off having somebody cut on you. And uh, it worked. Uh, I did travel constantly for my business. I carried my MRI and my doctor's uh, information with me. And sure enough, the night before when I went to bed, I said, God, I just feel like my discs are going to go out. This is, uh, I don't know if I'll uh, make it or not. Uh, I actually went to bed, got up, and I unhooked the upper lock on my uh, hotel door thinking, what happens if somebody has to come in and get me? And okay. by golly, at 2 o'clock I woke up paralyzed from basically my chest down. I did have my arms and hands. And so I wasn't terribly worried. Uh, I'd had really? knee surgery with a spinal block before, and I just figured, well, I pinched the nerve really bad. Uh, I guess I'm going to get an operation. You, so you know, you're, that's it, that's funny you say that. You weren't worried. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of times in, in the book that you're you're kind of a guy's guy, and um, 
most of us would be worried, I think, if we woke up and we weren't able to feel our legs. But like you said, you, you'd experienced maybe something similar before. So you, you send a text. Who are you texting yeah, at 2 in the morning? I, I sent a text to uh, three of my people, and I said, hey, when you get up in the morning, uh, come check on me. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the hospital. I sent a text to my CEO, and I said, I'm sorry, but I think you're giving my speech at 8.30. So anyway, we knew each other well enough. And 7 o'clock, all three of my friends came in, and I said, let's get me an ambulance. Uh, no lights, sirens. I don't want to wake everybody up. And get, coming through the back door, we got a big continental breakfast going. I don't need 1,500 agents seeing me wheeled away. So uh, it worked out, got me to the hospital. I showed them my... Uh, MRI, I told them what the problem was, they shot me up, uh, I got a corporate plane in the next morning, and went home. Okay, so you so you get back home, and in the book, there's a day or two before you actually take yourself back to the hospital, is that right? Yeah, we get home on a Saturday, and everybody wanted me to go to the hospital, <coughs> I was getting movement back in my legs and my feet, and I said, nah, it's all right, uh, uh, they'll operate on me, I'm sure, on Monday. Let's go to the hospital on Sunday. Uh, I've medicated myself with Oxycontin and all the prescriptions that they had given me, but the pain was excruciating. So 5 o'clock in the morning, I finally called my son, and I said, uh, hey, come pick me up. I've, I've got to get to emergency room. They checked me in a hospital. got a nice little suite of rooms, and uh, they called my back doctor and they're going to uh, uh, thinking I'm going to be operated Monday morning and so sometime that afternoon uh, drugged up with some morphine and good drugs I went to sleep and I woke up uh, four months later completely paralyzed uh, with the cognitive reasoning ability of a kindergarten student Wow okay so I mean uh, the, the book is an interesting read it, I mean, it's quick too, and it it really pulls you in. I I like that you because you, like you said, you wake up four months later and you literally don't know what happened. And so the book is kind of cobbled together from the the recollections and the experiences of your family and your friends and and some of the people that that came in and visited you. So you literally have the the last thing you remember is what being checked in at the hospital. You know the the first day's foggy. Uh, and I came to a little bit in intensive care uh, for an hour or so, uh, foggy in and out. And then the next four months, uh, I only have one memory of the whole four months. And then it was uh, it was time to start trying to figure out how to rebuild my life. Okay, so for just for everybody that's on the call that hasn't had a chance to read the book, what happened, Dave? I mean, what put you into to essentially a four-month coma? Uh, well, you know, everybody hears about infections and so on. Uh, staff infections are very critical, especially the older you get. Uh, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. It took them a week. Uh, but uh, apparently I had MRSA, which is a type of a staph infection. It's fairly common. Uh, we tried to go back in time to figure out where I got it. And in November, I bought a, uh an electric car called a Tesla and they delivered it to the house. Uh, I plugged it in on a big extension cord, went in the house and told everybody, hey, there's an extension cord stretched out. Don't trip over it. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow we'll tape it down, and then I'll get a permanent plug put in for this electric car. 10.30 at night, I forget, taking the trash out in the garage, walked across, tripped on it, and fell flat on my face, caught myself with my arms and scratched them up really deep, uh, but no stitches necessary, so we washed them and cleaned them and put hydrogen peroxide and neosporum on it, and, you know, they bled and we bandaged them and didn't worry about it. And as far as we can tell, that was November, and so staph infection got in my body, uh, turned septic, and the day I went in the hospital, it was in my lungs, my blood, uh, the infection had spread to my spine, and uh, as I went unconscious, uh, first I lost my kidneys, uh, then my liver, then my lungs. They put a ventilator on me. They started trying to keep me alive, told the uh, family high probability I would never survive. 
and uh, Valentine's Day, two weeks later, uh, the staph infection entered my heart. I flatlined on the screen. A cardiologist that was uh, going down the hallway, uh, I'd played golf with, but had never uh, been my cardiologist. I didn't have one. Uh, ran in, pulled everything out of my mouth and lungs and stuff, and started CPR and uh, got my heart beating again. Wow. And about six weeks later, I started being foggy. They moved me from hospital to hospital, and I ended up at Craig Rehabilitation Center for spinal cord injuries. So the, the book does a really good job, I think, of taking us through that time. And, and I love what you just said a second ago, because you basically said, well, I, look, I, I was out for four months, and then I woke up, and, and then it was, how am I going to get better? And, and I think that the book, and even you just saying that little sentence right there, really gives a sense for for who you are and kind of the way that you deal with things. So in the book, and you, you relate this back to a story, and, and so your wife was in a really bad plane crash in 1983, is that right? Uh, that's correct, and uh, she ended up with a severe closed head injury <clears throat> uh, after eight weeks of hospitalization, stabilized enough, and actually we put her into Craig Rehab Hospital. They also handle not just spinal cord but head injury. And uh, she was a patient off and on for three years. And I think a lot of the a lot of the stuff that comes out in this book is obvious that it's based on the, kind of the the things that you learned in the rehabilitation process with your wife. And one of those things, and you you talk about it in terms of this was not something that in terms of when you had your wife in in rehabilitation that you that you overtly knew of, this, this concept that Jack Canfield talks about in his Success Principles book, which is E plus R equals O, or event plus reaction equals outcome. Now, in the book, you say, looking back on the experience with your wife, you realized that, that you did this, and, and maybe you'd always done something like this in your world. But to talk for a second about Canfield's idea of event plus reaction equals outcome, and then maybe if you could, is there any way for you to pinpoint, like, Prior to having read this book and kind of gotten this philosophy from Canfield, why were you the type of guy that just did this, that always kind of looked for that, the reaction and, and how it was going to impact the outcome? Oh, you know, I've been in personal development my entire sales career. Uh, started out with uh, all of the old names that uh, nobody recognizes now, but uh, self-development was very important to me. Uh, when I read Jack Canfield's success principles, I was actually doing tours throughout uh, the United States on distressed property. And the event that we were talking about was, well, we've got the greatest real estate recession in history, subprime mess. It's happened to you. What's your reaction going to be? And the reaction should be, well, okay, I was getting all my business from repeats and referrals. They're not buying or selling now. I guess my reaction is, I better figure out how to get distressed property. How do I learn short sales? How do I talk to a bank banker? <coughs> and if you did that successfully, the outcome is uh, you still made a living, and we've survived this crisis, and now we're getting back into a, a, a normal market. Well, the E plus R equals O, uh, I thought a lot about Gail's injury, the event was a plane crash and a closed head injury and paralysis on one side. Uh, her reaction as she started going through the rehabilitation process uh, and being surrounded by salespeople like myself was, okay, the accidents happen. I can't cry over spilt milk. I'm not going to look at what I had. I'm going to look forward to what I can have. She never once said, why me? Uh, she never once cried. She never once said this isn't fair uh, or anything like that. It's just I'm going to walk out of this hospital and I'm going to make the best life I can make. So there's a really interesting story that you tell in the book about when Gail was, was going through her rehab and one of her nurses had kind of seen the signs of you potentially on the edge of cracking and had asked you to go join a, a support group and, and you had gone in there and you tell kind of a 
I don't know, looking back, it's a funny story, I think, that you weren't very happy to be there. And, and as they went around the room and kind of asked everybody why they were there, every, all of the other folks in the room gave um, kind of, I don't want to call it the sob story of why they were there, but it was essentially that they, they seemed to not be able to look past why they were there. And you were very much all you were focused on was, look, we're here and we ultimately want some outcome out of this, which is to not be here. Um, so when, when you're looking at this sort of a scenario, you know, event plus reaction equals outcome, are you coming at it from there's an outcome I want to achieve or are you just saying, look, this event happened and I know I need to have a certain reaction? Like, So is it like a goal setting thing where you know the outcome or are you just – just in your brain saying that, that I'm going to have this reaction, which one comes first, I guess, the reaction or, or you, you kind of have the outcome in mind? I think the reaction happens. Uh, I can remember that uh, laying in the hospital, uh, the only thought I can remember in the first uh, eight weeks was I want to give up. Uh, I was tired. I hurt. I was depressed. Uh, I could hear people talking, I had a ventilator, I couldn't communicate, I was totally paralyzed, and I just thought to myself, you know, you've had a hell of a life, and uh, that's okay, let's just give it up. And I laid there trying to think, how can I die? Uh, I couldn't move my arms or hands, right. so I couldn't unplug anything or pull anything out of my, my uh, mouth or anything like that. I tried holding my breath, that didn't work. <laughs> and someplace later that night, it just came to me, and I said, you know, David, you're really, and I'm going to clean this up since we're on a, a <laughs> telephone with some ladies on it, okay. uh, but I, I, I had a little cussing pity party, and I said, basically, you know, you're really a phony hypocrite. Uh, you've given seminars your entire life to realtors. Don't ever give up. You know, do something. And I said, you know what? I'm not giving up. I got doctors and nurses. I'm surrounded by people. I can't talk to anybody. But if I'm going to be a paraplegic, I'm going to be the best damn paraplegic they've ever had in this hospital. And I will make something of my life. And uh, that's about all. I don't remember anything for a couple more months. It's the only thing I can remember in that eight, I guess it was four month period. And so the reaction wasn't the, I will walk out of here, I guess. It was, well, I'll be the best I can possibly be. Do you have any sense, where does, it, like you said, you, you've, you've been all about personal development over the course of your career. So is this, I mean, is this something then like having that sort of a reaction, is that something you believe somebody can teach themselves to, to look at things in that way? Or is that something that you think you, you were born with? Or is it maybe a combination of the two? No, absolutely not. You learn it. You okay. learn from the people you're around. You learn, you learn from what you immerse yourself in. Uh, I've seen a lot of people who really think they're into personal development, and all they do is talk about it, and you sit there, and you hear some speakers and stuff, and you can do this, and you can do that, and you find out that they don't have any money. Uh, it's all just show and flash. Uh, you know, I used it. I didn't wear it on my sleeve. I taught it. I taught Think and Grow Rich to thousands of people. And when you are immersed in a positive climate, it rubs off on you. And so you're, is, the, is the glass half full or half empty? You start developing a personality. And my personality, uh, being around top producing real estate agents, uh, listening to motivational speakers, uh, playing tapes and, and CDs and stuff in your car, uh, it's just been my lifestyle, and so it's made me into what I am today. All right, so at one point, you're, you're in the book, you talk about your lane here, you've, you've come out of this thing, um, but, but you have kind of this realization that you've completely lost control, and maybe for the first time in your life, you don't really have control over anything. Um, it, it's interesting to me that right away in the book, you go in – and you, you, you relate it to your business, and you said, look, I've had control over things my entire life. In fact, in the early days of Remax, you were the janitor and the, the bookkeeper, and you, you did everything along with your wife. Uh, at some point in your business, though, you decided you had to give up control of certain things for the business to be able to grow. 
and I and I think you realize as you're laying on your back in the hospital that you're going to be giving control up to certain people, whether it be your kids to make decisions or your wife or um, you know the the people at Remax who you've already put in place to to help run Remax. Talk for a second about the early years of Remax in terms of giving up control to people that you trusted, and how were you able to do that when when I mean. You're admit in the book. In some ways, you were a control freak prior to doing that. Well, you know, um, there's different kinds of control. Uh, if I know somebody was capable of doing something, I never had to look back twice and ask them, "How are you doing?" or "Can I help you?" You had to do it this way. And so, once you find competent people, why in the world would you do what they're doing? Uh, pay them. Find people that are better than yourself. And so. As I grew as an entrepreneur, I also figured out that I wanted to be a professionally managed company. I didn't want held back by the restraints of being a one person that was in charge. And so very early in my career, I mean, I wasn't wealthy. Uh, I made good money. But uh, fairly early in the career, I was taking uh, like two, three-week safaris to Africa. Uh, we didn't have satellite phones. We didn't have communication. I had no problem walking out of the office. I had a great staff. They could handle everything for three weeks. Uh, I sat around a campfire one time with a, a professional hunter that was much older than me at the time, and he said, uh, I have to ask you a question. You're a businessman. You got this big real estate company back in the States. He said, uh, how can you just leave for three weeks at a time and not even think about it? And I said, well, my staff started the company with me. They know as much about it as I do. They're going to run it just fine. I don't need to call. And he said, well, you know, he in his life he had found out that if number one wasn't around, number two could usually run it just as well as number one. But if number one is there, people try to go around number two to get to number one. That's an amazing comment. I mean, for realtors who are building their offices or for team members that have uh, you know, two or three team members working for them. You just have to learn. If you teach them, leave them alone. They'll get it done. It's it's interesting you say that. So let's let's talk about teams for a second, if you don't mind. Give it, somebody for a for a single agent right now that's looking at the idea of bringing on somebody to their business to help them. What's a piece of advice you could give somebody to, to, to convince them that it's worth the idea of bringing somebody else on to kind of ease the burden of some of the things that they take, that they handle in their business? Well, you know, the concept of teams is fine. Uh, and, and team members can do things for you uh, that are cheaper than you can do them. Let's, let's say that you're really an outstanding real estate agent and that when you're face-to-face, -face, with a client, uh, closing, showings, whatever, you might figure out that 20% of your time in the year, you're totally face-to-face -face with clients, and you make $100,000 a year. So that 20% of 2,000 hours is 400 hours, and 400 hours, well, that's, I guess that's saying you're making 50 bucks an hour. Why would you do anything in your life if you could pay somebody else to do it cheaper? That's why secretaries are outstanding because uh, you can take a secretary salary, uh, $20,000 a year maybe, maybe 30, that's $15 an hour. Well, they should do anything possible that you don't have to do because you're paying them 15 an hour. That means you have more hours you can be face to face with clients. So why not, instead of spending 20% of your time in front of clients, spend 40% of your time you will double your income, and then what do you have to pay? You have to pay $15 an hour to somebody else to do that uh, 200 hours worth of work of putting up signs, measuring, driving things around, filling up your car with gas and getting it washed. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been to a filling station in years. I don't do my own uh, Lawn mowing. If that's your hobby and you get off on that, that's great. <laughs> I haven't, uh, I haven't done my lawns in over forty some years. I pay everybody. It's much cheaper. And so when you look at getting an assistant, 
uh, the assistant can do things for you. And then by the same token, if you have more buyers or sellers than you can handle, well, then share your commission and bring somebody on, teach them. Uh, their job is to make you money. It isn't your job to give them a job and pay them. Their job when they come to work for you is you got to figure out how you make money on that person. I think some of the, the, the – when you look at, like, the top – lists of agents every year and these guys that are selling 500 you know 400 homes a year most of these guys have teams and they've ultimately figured out how how do i take the ultimate advantage of my time so um that's a good little piece of advice right there so you all right so you're you're you mentioned two books. Canfield's book is one. The other book that you mentioned inside of your book is Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And you, I think you, you say in there that you've read this book numerous times throughout your career, but th there's a few kind of topics that you touch on from the book. And the one, one that I've got here for us is the idea of setting goals. So you're, you're laying on your back. What is take me through the mindset of, of how this book and kind of these steps, you know, set achievable goals, make a plan, a step by step, have a mastermind group, and then never ever quit until you achieve your goal. How did that play into your, your rehabilitation? Uh, Think and Grow Rich is the uh, most impactful book and concept that I've ever read. I read it when I was 16. I've reread it 50 times. I am actually rereading it right now. And it's just basically those steps is what it takes to build yourself your life that you want. And so I'm laying there and I'm saying, all right, I'm paralyzed. So what am I going to have to do? Well, the first one was an achievable goal. Uh, I made up my mind I was going to walk out of that hospital. Now, we didn't know the extent of the spinal cord damage that had been done by this infection. If I had a severed spinal cord, uh, achievable goal was not that I would walk. If your spinal cord is severed, medical technology and ability right now, it is severed. You can lay in bed and look at your toe and say, move toe, and you can say that for 30 years, your toe isn't going to move. I thought that I would walk, and there was no proof that my spinal cord was completely severed. And so the achievable goal was if I could walk just 10 steps, think of the, think of the freedom and the control you would have versus being paralyzed. Now let me put it in context for you. Over a three or four month period of time, they got me up into a sitting position. They got me into an electric wheelchair. Uh, my left side came back, but my right side was very, very uh, damaged, and it took forever. It took six months to be able to move my right hand. So, but as I started to be able to sit up, as I started to be able to move around a little bit, then I kept thinking, do you know what the freedom is to be able to walk two or three steps? So uh, I told my doctors I was going to walk out of there. And the doctors, of course, would look at you with a sad look in their eyes, and they'd say, Dave, uh, we hope for the best and we train for the worst. Well, that's really encouraging. Uh, if they overpromise, they get sued. If they say, of course, you're going to walk and you don't, then you sue them and say, you must have done something wrong. You said I was going to walk. So the medical community says we train for the worst, hope for the best. My friends, on the other hand, said, hell yes, you're going to walk out of here. You've made every goal you've ever set in your life. Let's work hard, buddy. So, you know, what's the plan? And my plan was that I would outwork anybody in that hospital. When they told me to do five reps of something with my left hand, I wanted to do ten. If they told me I had one hour of therapy a day, I wanted two. And then you create the step-by-step -step plan. And then the mastermind group, that's your, that's your support group, medical, technicians, whatever, but it's also your friends. And so you, you put this formula together that, that uh, Napoleon Hill came up with. It's not original. This has been in all kinds of self-help books for a couple hundred years. He just said it better than anybody up in his time. That is the blueprint of how you become successful. Can I ask you, so you're, 
you're reading this book again for possibly the 51st time, I mean, a lot of times. As you read back through this book, when you read it again, are, are you focusing on like certain things? And give me, give me the thought process behind reading a book for the 50th time and, and, and how, is, do you look at it different? Are there certain things that, that maybe you, you didn't see before that you see again? Or like, Oh, you know, the thing's remarkable is I have outlined it, I have typed it, uh, I have underlined it, I've done all this stuff, and this is one of hundreds of books that I've got. I Personally, I think Canfield's book today is probably better than Think and Grow Rich. But, you know, you keep posting that. I'll tell you, so I've, I had the knee replacement three years ago, mm -hmm. and so I had to sit on my butt for two months, and I got out my uh, books and so on, and I started reading Think and Grow Rich, and I usually skip the introduction because I know what it's going to say. And all of a sudden, I read a sentence, and it says, I'm writing this in 1936. And uh, when, you, when you read it, that was during the Great Depression. Right. And all of a sudden, you know, this is two, three years ago in the middle of the worst housing recession in the world, and I had never seen, I knew it was, 50 or 100 years old, and all of a sudden I said, my goodness, he's writing this in the Depression, and this is very meaningful to uh, people that have 35% unemployment. And I said his message was a message of hope. Set your goals, a step-by-step -step plan. You're not going to achieve them overnight, but five years from now you have a better life. Yeah, I keep seeing more and more things from the different things that I read. Amazing. Now, right, so can, let me, can I share one other thing, Bob? Absolutely. Uh, Jim Rohn uh, was a phenomenal business philosopher. I heard him at a REMAX convention 10 years ago, and I thought, okay, that was nice. It meant nothing to me. I don't know why. And then uh, I'm sitting there with my knee replacement, and I listened to a tape series called A Weekend with Jim Rohn, and I thought he was the most brilliant person in the world. And in one story that he told, he said, you know, a college student can read a book in college that's required, and they think, ho-hum, they read the book. And then 30 years later, for some reason, they go read the same book, and there's an entirely different message, that they really see the impact of the book. And the thing's interesting was, you know, 30 years later, you might have been through a war. You might have seen death and destruction. You might have been married. You might have had a divorce. You might have lost a parent or a child. All these things color the way that you look at the world. And so he finally gave an example of his grandson, and he were motorbiking and dirt biking in the mountains, and it was late in the evening, and all of a sudden he saw the most glorious sunset. And he told the child, he says, isn't this the most glorious sunset you've ever seen? And the child says, yeah, granddad, that's nice. Hey, we better get going. Mom would be worried. And so Jim is sitting there thinking to himself, this is a marvelous sunset, but the child doesn't have the palette of colors of life experiences to associate this moment versus, well, we ought to get going because mom would be worried. So I think a lot of people start their real estate career thinking one thing, Five, ten, twenty years later, they think something else. Uh, the question is, are you improving every year? Are you learning from the mistakes you make? Are you uh, progressing in the way that you want? Uh, that's what these success books are about. And if you think about it, it's logical. You know, I, I to everybody on the call, I, I actually asked Dave, uh, in advance if they wanted to take a look at my questions and, and they never responded no or yes so he never got a look at the stuff that I've been asking him here um, so it's it's I guess apropos that you would bring up that story because I, I had a question in there and this was a this was a a theme that was prevalent throughout the book was this idea you, you say a few times in there you know had this happened at a different point in your life you might not have been mature enough or and you touched on this theme of maturity which you just kind of highlighted through the story that you just told. Get, can you maybe go back 
what are a couple, maybe give me one or two things in your career, and you, you talked about, you know, you have missteps or, or you, you fight in a war, or give me, give me one or two life experiences that you really think have shaped you to be the person who was able to deal with this and, and who has, has, you know, really bounced back from something that for a lot of people would have, would have you know, we would have found a way to, to pull the, the plug, essentially. Well, you know, everybody looks at somebody who is rich and famous and successful and says, wow, what a success. And you start thinking, boy, it must have been easy and or whatever. Uh, nobody that becomes incredibly successful uh, does so overnight. Uh, the uh, book, The Outliers, was talking about what it took not for uh, the Beatles to be successful, what it took for uh, the greatest hockey player to be successful, what it took for Bill Gates to become the incredible success he was. And in the outliers, their theme was it was about 10,000 hours of experience before somebody achieved great success. And 10,000 hours, I mean, Gates had 10,000 hours on computers by the time that he was 22 or 23 years old. I mean, he was 18 hours a day working with computers. It became his entire life. And so, you know, when I look back on my career, uh, let's, say, let's say these words. Um, courage comes from confidence, and confidence comes from experience. Now think about that for a minute. Courage comes from confidence, and confidence comes from experience. Uh, you aren't courageous the first day on anything, but if you have enough experiences, you get confident and you can find the courage. In building the REMAX organization, I had undergone everything that founders do. I had terrible lawsuits. I had uh, lots of mistakes I made trying to learn how to become a manager and a leader. Uh, I had losses that occurred in my life that... Uh, I devoted 18 hours a day to building a business and threw away a wife and children. Uh, you know, this this road to success wasn't this colorful road that was lined with roses, but if you learn from each of the mistakes and you start to mold your life, uh, each one of those failures uh, you learn from, each one of them that you overcome makes you stronger. I remember laying in bed, uh, probably after waking up for three or four months. I'm working really hard at my therapy. As a matter of fact, uh, my therapist and my nurses were so good, I would say, I want to work another hour, but I hurt so much. Come on, give me a shot of morphine. And they would give me a shot right into my IV of morphine, and I would try to work for another hour because I was desperate to get better. You know, you, I just, somebody looked at me and said, Dave, God won't give you any more than you can handle. And I would say, well, I don't know about you, but whatever it is, I'm surviving. I hope to hell he never gives me anything this hard again, because I don't want to ever do anything this hard again. And so, you know, every time you live through a disaster, every time you, you live through another traumatic experience, you know, anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's and actually, so I mean, we, that's, a, that, that's a, a cliche in some ways, but it's true, right? Yes, it is true. And, you know, there are muscles in your arms and legs, and there's muscles in your brain. Uh, Self-discipline, that's a muscle. Uh, it's, it, the more you exercise it, the stronger you become. And so when you overcome the day-to-day -day obstacles, and there's obstacles out there for everybody, and then when you start seeing what other people are facing, it's so much easier. I, I gave, I think, one of the most fantastic speeches at my convention in a wheelchair, uh, surrounded by people that have been incredibly supportive to me. Uh, many of them had known me for 30 or 40 years. And I'm sitting there giving this speech, and it was... It was good for my soul, it was good for my spirit, or whatever it might be. But, you know, it is what I had trained for 
for 60 some years of my life. This wasn't just an automatic thing that I became successful overnight. I had the confidence to rebuild my life because of all the minor day-to-day -day failures that I overcame and the successes that I had achieved. Let me let me ask you a question about so from this perspective on somebody who's in the real estate business and you talked about exper or, uh, experience breeds confidence and confidence breeds courage. As, as, let's say I'm a brand new agent or I've been in the business for three years. Or maybe I've even been in the business for ten years. As a real estate agent, where should I be looking or what should I be doing? That, that can help me kind of get to that 10,000 hours of experience? I mean, is it a matter of, you know, pouring through the MLS and looking at data? Is it a matter of just, you know, making the phone calls all the time? Like, where does an, where do you think an agent really gets that experience that allows them to, to, to get to that level of courage? It's being face-to-face -face with the client. <clears throat> I have taught time management programs forever. And we did time management studies on REMAX agents and said, why do some agents make 50000 a year and why do some of them make 500000 hours a year? And so we started teaching a course and said, make a to-do list of everything you're going to do today. And they do it. And then I'd say, okay, go through and put an A, B, and a C in front of everything. Now, A's uh, uh, make you money. That's listing presentations, showing houses that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Bs lead you to money, and that is like sitting on the floor time, uh, prospecting, uh, uh, passing out your business cards, and Cs are necessary evils, uh, getting gas in your car, picking up the dry cleaning, all that type of thing. And I said, now go through your list, and are you going to spend 80% of your time on the A's? And people making thirty to 50000 a year spend 80% of their time on their C's and B's. Which is essentially say, okay. most of the industry, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, that's 95% that's of the industry. Right. Yeah. And you know what you do? You do the C's first because they're easy and you can check them off. Oh, i got to go get my car gassed up. I need to go cash a check. Oh, um, so you just mark through all the C's. You get through the day. You weren't in front of a customer one minute. You didn't get paid. You only get paid for A's. Once you can... Once you can put your mind into a focus mode and you start figuring out uh, how much money do you make uh, when you're face-to-face -face with clients, that's your entire income that you make. That's the only place you make money is talking to another warm, living, breathing, non-realtor human being. Once you figure out that uh, you make your entire income on the hours you spend with clients, Divide that number of hours, which is usually 20% of your time, and when you look at the C's and B's, you make nothing. You want to make more money, find a way to spend 30% of your time with clients instead of 20 or 40%. Every week of your life in the real estate business, you ought to figure out how do I get in front of possible buyers and sellers. That's the only thing that counts. Sales meetings, absolutely worthless. Sorry. They really are. This is a sales meeting, by the way. Okay? So, you know, nobody's making any money right now. You're all listening to us talk. Somebody else is out there showing houses, for crying out loud. So, no, Touché. but in reality, <laughs> do, you, do you understand right. what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are necessary evils. And if, you, if you go to a training program, what are you doing? You're learning how to sharpen your knife so you can chop things down faster. And so, sure, training is important. That's a C, but you got to have some training. If you're going to figure out how to do REOs, you better get a CDPE or something. But, you know, it's focus. How do you focus and put more hours day-to-day -day into the A's, and how do you delegate or throw away or put off the B's and C's as much as you can? That's a great answer. So, um, thankfully... You, so you, you you you've come a long way in in it's been 18 months now, but at this point it had been not even a year, and you're back for your 2013 real estate predictions, and um, so, so <laughs> I kind of chuckle at this because I, 
I didn't find the 2012 ones, but I'm, you made 10 in 2013, so I'm assuming that in 2012 you made 10 as well. And the remat, the crack staff at Remax, as you put it, um, told you that in 2012, 85% of your predictions were right, which I mean, guess means eight of them were right, one of them you got half right, and then you missed half, and you, you missed one. Um, so that's pretty darn good. In 2013, you've got another set of... 10 predictions. If, if anybody wants to watch Dave's predictions for 2013, it's a, a very interesting take from a guy who's obviously been around for a long time and, and has, I think, at your disposal, Dave, a, a pretty amazing staff of people that, that goes through and, and crunches numbers. You guys are doing this on a monthly basis. but So here, here's the predictions from 2013. Kerry's going to send out this YouTube link if you guys want to take a look at Dave's predictions. There's one prediction in there that I'm particularly interested in, and, and it's the idea of a shortage of listings, and you actually say as a prediction that this will ease, and we will start to see a return to more normal levels of listing in, or of inventory. This is starting to happen, and, and the, the, you guys sent me these numbers from the April Remax housing report that the, the, the average number of home sales is still 27% lower than last year. And in some markets, and I was looking at some data from NAR for May, in some markets it's as much as 40% under what it was the year before. But the month-to-month -month inventory is back a little bit in April, and in this, we've seen the same thing in May. It's up actually up a little bit more in May. Um, but some of these areas still have massively low I mean, really historically low levels of inventory where like in San Francisco in April there was a one month supply of inventory and you can see some of the other numbers in here. Dave, what do you, I mean obviously the opportunity here is to go out and, and, and get listings because as the market starts to kind of come back into balance, um, people are you know, more apt to, to want to list their home. Maybe Give me some advice. If I'm somebody as a listing agent who's wanting right now to kind of take advantage of this um, shortage, what would be your advice to somebody to, to do that? How, how would somebody take, take advantage of this kind of, I mean, it's a shortage, and, and some people are going to look at it as a problem, but is there an opportunity in here? Well, yes, there is. And first, you have to understand we have very little control over what's happening. Right. Um, you know, it's supply and demand. It's always been supply and demand. And the demand is high because there's pent-up demand from regular buyers, uh, people that didn't get married. The family formation rate for five years basically disappeared. Uh, the economy was bad. People were scared to death because the stock market dropped 50%. Uh, all these things had come about. And then, of course, prices are low, interest rates are low, investors weren't making any money elsewhere, they've come into the business. Prices are coming back up, the investors are starting to slowly drop out of the business because the great bargains are disappearing. And so uh, if the investor pressure goes away, uh, there'll be more properties. Last year, 1.2 million families uh, came above water, in other words, they had negative uh, uh, equity, uh, 1.2 million came out of being underwater. The first quarter of this year, 900,000 came back up above water. That's a huge change. Yeah. Uh, that's because house prices are coming up faster. And so as you see, if there is less pressure from the investor buyers, uh, if more people are coming up uh, from being negative equity, uh, they can get out of the circumstance they're in without taking cash to the table, uh, we'll go back to a more sane model. What every real estate agent ought to be doing is working hard, beating the bushes, trying to find people that might not recognize that they can get out of their house. There's a lot of people that say, well, my house price dropped 30%. I'd like to buy another house, but you know, I just, I don't want to take a hit. Well, you know, your house price went down 30%. It's come back up 10. You're above water. Why not sell it right now and go buy the better house that you wanted for the last five years before it's outpriced? You might take a haircut on the one you're selling, but you're getting the one you're buying at a huge bargain. 
So the opportunity is is the ability to educate folks who may not realize that they're in a position to, to sell without bringing money to the table. That's right. All right, I've got a couple of questions that, that came. So we, you know, Active Rain is a community of real estate professionals. We, we are kind of based around the idea of, of a blogging platform. And so I, I put a blog post out that kind of asked our members, hey, is there, you know, I, I've got this guy who I'm incredibly um, – ecstatic to be able to talk to for for an hour so are there questions that you guys might have if you were able to bend Dave Linegar's ear for an hour and, and one of the questions that kind of came up continually from people was the idea of raising the bar or quality control for the real estate industry so I guess my question to you on that Dave is there's you know we've got state licensing agencies you got the National Association of Realtors you've got obviously brokerages in play who do you look at as kind of the fundamental agency or, or place or person or, or organization responsible for quality control within the industry. Do you think that's the job of state licensing? Is it a brokerage's job? Is it the uh, National Association of Realtors' job? What's your feeling on that? Now, the problem you've got is uh, the state licensing boards and so on uh, try not to put barriers to entry of more competition. Uh, they want more competition. They want more people in the business. Uh, it's a rather stupid attitude. Uh, let, let me put it in perspective for you. If you want to be a real estate agent in the state of Colorado, you have to go to 280 hours of training. If you want to be a masseuse massaging somebody, you have to have 600 hours of experience before you can charge for the service. Yeah, in Washington it's even worse. It's like 90 hours, I believe, in, in the state of Washington to get your license. Yeah, and, and the problem is uh, none of us have any control over the quality. The broker owner does, and he can be careful about who he hires, but uh, nine out of ten other brokers on the other side of the street will all hire anybody that's breathing. Uh, you know, you've, you've got uh, you have very little quality control. What you need to do is control your own self. You control yourself with your quality. Thank God everybody else out there is a loser. They make you look better for <laughs> you being professional. I mean, do you think there's a – is this a real issue? Like, is, is – do, do consumers look at the real estate industry? I mean, is this something that we should be concerned about? Or do you think that as an individual agent, like you just said, I mean, you can literally forget about the perception of the industry and just focus on yourself? I, you know, for the owner of the company, you focus on your team. Uh, for the individual agent, focus on yourself. I've listened to this for 45 years that I've been right. in the business, and it's just as bad today as it was back then. Uh, Century 21, who does have some good agents, uh, you know, they were bragging they were number one because they have the most agents. Uh, we beat them out in transactions, productivity, and so on uh, in 1993 with 30,000 agents when they had 100,000. Everybody wants to brag that they're number one at something. And so uh, actually in the C21 trial against Remax, one of the things that came out of it was I told them, you can brag that you've got the most beginners, part-timers, and losers. <laughs> and uh, that was actually part of the court trial, which by the way, we won and we got punitive damages against them. Uh, the C21 agents and brokers beg the national company, don't sue Remax. We do deals together. You know, this is your ego problem, not theirs, not ours. The agents were, and the brokers were great. So you just, you got to get over the fact that, I'm sorry, we can't control what's out there. Uh, try to help people, try to teach them. But the main thing is, be as professional as you can possibly be. Surround yourself with other professionals. That's good advice. Good advice. All right. So, I mean, you, we, we kind of started off, and you mentioned uh, what the business looked like, you know, at, at different points across your your career. I mean, the last I don't know what it's been eight or ten years has seen rapid evolution in in technology and in, in inside of real estate. The one thing that hasn't changed a whole lot is the actual transaction itself. Now you've got some things that have helped streamline it, you know, things like DocuSign or or e-signatures and you know make it a little bit easier. Um, 
from the perspective of technology moving forward, and let's say you, you know, it's really hard to look out even five years with how rapidly things are evolving. Is, is there anything, maybe if you're an agent in the next two years, from a technology perspective that you would you would think to yourself, like this is something that I would would want to be have my eye on, or or do you think that it's just all about getting belly to belly with people? Well, you know, we're in a unique business. Uh, that is very complex. Uh, it gets more and more complex all the time. Forty years ago, our uh, sales agreements were two pages long. There weren't home inspections. There wasn't radon. There wasn't anything. And so the industry has become far more complex than it was, and that's fine. Technology is not going to put us out of business. It's our servant. You have to embrace it. But I will tell you the biggest change that's going on right now is in mobile apps. Okay. Uh, mobile uh, phones, iPads, all that type of thing uh, is now creating more leads in the real estate business uh, than we've ever seen. There are over 50% of the inquiries are coming because people can be driving in the neighborhood, see a, a listing, and they can pull it up right there on the spot. So mobile apps are important. Do you guys have a strategy at Remax for, for your mobile app? Yes, we uh, keep trying to design and redesign it and partner with somebody that might even have something better. Uh, mobile apps will be important to us in the future. The uh, other thing we have to look at, and I know we're down to two to three minutes, uh, is who are our future competitors. Uh, if Zillow and Trulia are uh, truly advertising mechanisms, uh, they are just like newspapers were a few years ago. And so if they're a great source of leads, they are our partners. They are not our competitors. But the day that somebody that is a partner turns on you and decides to start their own offices or their own branches is the day you've got to walk away from that partnership and defend yourself. God bless you, Dave. I'm so glad you brought this up. So I wasn't going to ask this question because for, I should – be upfront, okay? So, um, Active Rain is owned by Market Leader, which was recently purchased by Trulia. So we're now under the umbrella of Trulia, but you guys have a good relationship with with both Zillow and Trulia, and so you you you, you guys send your listings there. You've got some marketing agreements with them, but you just made a comment um, that the moment that these things turn into something other than an advertising partnership, essentially, um, what is your so? What is your thought on, like, let's take Zillow for it, on them be, the ability for them to disintermediate the real estate agent, do you think that that is a, a possibility at any point in the future? Uh, I've been around long enough to know that anything can happen. The okay. truth of the matter is the contract, the seller, the buyer are the property of the real estate agent. The day that we abdicate that role, we are no longer in charge of the transaction. There are technology geniuses out there that plot every day, how can I bankrupt this group of people and take their business away? Travel agencies are a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Amazon.com versus the ordinary retail bookstore is a perfect example. The technology geniuses haven't figured out how to screw the realtor out of anything except for their advertising funds. Trust me, there are people behind the scenes who are trying to figure out how can we replace the realtor and do this cheaper and better and us take the money. What the realtors have to do is be aware of who is their partner and who is going to be their adversary. And the minute that there's any indication that person's an adversary, uh, the realtor must protect their own ground. Now, Man. the Zillows and the Trulias can't make it without the listing inventory. So if you become an adversary and you want to start your own shops and you want to uh, be the person that's going to uh, destroy the realtor's income, at that moment, every realtor needs to get together and say, well, you don't have our inventory anymore. The relationship is not a mechanical relationship of an MLS with the seller or with an uh, intermediary and the seller. The relationship is with the real estate agent and the seller. 
Man, uh, you know what? I could talk to you about for uh, just about this one subject for an hour longer. <laughs> but Dave, man, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. It's been um, an absolute pleasure for me, and I, I I know all the folks on the line really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing a little bit with us. Thank you very much. Hey, it's a great life. Being a realtor is fantastic. All right, you guys. Hey, if you want to check out Dave's book, My Next Step, Dave, get, real quick here. So all of the proceeds from the book go to three uh, charities that, that you and your wife and, and Remax support. Just touch on those charities real quick for me. Uh, Wounded Warrior Project is obviously very dear to my heart. I'm a veteran. Children's Hospital has been a big deal. Susan Coleman, obviously, 55, 60% of our staff is female. Uh, they're important charities to us. I didn't want to try to make any money off the book. It did make the New York Times bestseller. Uh, any of my proceeds go to the charities. It's just I'm hoping the book is uh, inspirational to other people because I certainly needed inspiration for a long year myself. Well, Dave, you've been an inspiration to a lot of folks over 40 years. So, again, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, everybody... On behalf of Dave Linegar and uh, myself and the folks behind the scenes here at Acavarina, I hope you enjoyed our, our talk today. Dave, thanks. Uh, I really appreciate it, and maybe we can do this again at some point in the future. You bet. Thanks, Bob. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Um, on behalf of Acavarina University, bye-bye, everyone.